right, welcome to week 13. Uh, we're getting down there in weeks left to go. It's this week, then we got two more weeks, and then finals week. So uh, I hope everybody's keeping up. So what we're going to be talking about this week involves uh, developing an academic writing style. Uh, so we're going to be talking about what it takes to actually have your writing sound like it's academic in nature and make you sound like you know what you're talking about. So one thing to remember, keep in mind is that academic writing is a conversation. Okay, uh, You are intended to try to talk with other academics through your writing. Rather than just a one-sided information dump, most academic essays act as one part of a conversation, which means there's somebody else that's talking in the room, where disputed claims are investigated, evaluated, and debated. Okay, So the big thing here is you want to be uh, aware of how your writing affects the conversation, what you're contributing to it, and whether you sound like you belong in that conversation or not. So in order to participate in the conversation, both the writer and the audience need to be speaking the same language and have a clear conception of what the different terminology being used to investigate the subject are. Okay, You need to be able to, to understand you. So your audience has to have some kind of base knowledge, and you have to know what that base knowledge is when you're writing for them. Okay, You as a writer are responsible for making sure this relationship is maintained in your work. Okay, uh, make sure that you are communicating with your audience in a way that's clear to them and it fits within the conventions of the field. Okay, uh, on my page 218, uh, and I double checked this in the online version, it's at the beginning of chapter 19. Uh, there is a three paragraph passage here, uh, it's an essay about sailing, it has a great deal of specific terminology that unless you're a sailor yourself or come from a sailing or navy family you might not be familiar with okay so uh as such the burden of explanation rests on the author therefore to ensure that his or her audience understands the specific terminology okay uh just for funsies here is what the uh how it reads okay uh have fun trying to figure out what they're talking about if you don't if you don't know sailing no matter how good the sails look, no boat sails well when they are pulling her over extreme angles of heel. When a boat heels excessively, she slows down, develops severe weather helm, and wallows sluggishly through the water. She must be brought back upright by depowering the sails. If powering in light and moderate winds means to make the sails full at narrow angles of attack, depowering in winds stronger than about 15 knots apparent means to flatten sails and trim them wider. The main sheet works quickest. When a gust hits and the boat begins to flop over, quickly ease out one or more feet of main sheet and keep it eased until she rights herself. Either the helmsman or a crew can cast the sheet off. The former when he first feels the drastic weather helm through the tiller or the, or the wheel. The latter when he sees the helmsman begin to fight the helm. Even though the wildly luffing mainsail may seem to be wasted, the boat is sailing better because she's sailing on her bottom. The jib sheet may also be eased quickly in fresh winds to spill air from the jib. The jib sheet should be moved outboard in fresh and strong winds to decrease side force and increase forward force. It may also be moved aft to increase the amount of twist in the upper part of the sail, effectively spilling wind up high where it exerts the greatest healing leverage over the hull. Alright, good luck trying to figure out what he was just saying there if you were not a sailor. okay? Uh, this is an excerpt from a book titled The Annapolis Book of Seamanship by John Rusmanier. Okay, uh, it's from a book written specifically for sailors. Okay, uh, what's causing the, sh the problem here is the shift in audience. Now it's being presented to an audience that is non-sailors who may not necessarily be familiar with this terminology. As it is, I'm familiar with some of it uh, just because I... Used to, I come from a Navy family, so I've heard some of these terms before. I'm kind of familiar with what they mean, uh, but honestly, some of this stuff is kind of uh, overwhelming. Uh, let's see some of the terms that I, some of the terms I know about. Uh, the jib sheet is a reference to one of the sails. Uh, trim, trimming the sail usually means you're uh, reducing the amount of uh, surface area it has so that for the wind to catch. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, drastic weather helm, I'm not sure about. I know a tiller is if you have a, uh, it's a steering mechanism, if it's directly attached to the uh, uh, rudder of the ship. Uh, if it's something where it's sticking from the back and you're actually back there with the uh, control with it, that's a tiller. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a ship's wheel like you're probably familiar with. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, so, again, if if there's if you're a sailor, you probably know all this stuff, uh, but a non-sailor is not going to be familiar with this. Okay, so. It's up to you to know whether you're actually a part of the audience that's meant for that work, uh, or if you are someone who it's actually written for, or if you're somebody who's coming from an outside perspective and say and getting totally lost. All right. So when we're talking about academic conversations, there's four key components to them that which have to be considered kept in consideration as you write. Okay. Uh, one of them is important concepts or ideas, okay? When you are writing, you have to make sure that your important concepts are getting across and under being understood. Make sure your audience understands any specific concepts should be used consistently or else they'll fall behind in reading the essay and be unable to keep up, okay? So uh, when you're presenting concepts in your work, Explain it in a way that your average reader is going to understand, okay? Uh, and this is primarily aimed toward writers who are working with an academic audience, and it's typically one within the field that you're writing about, okay? Uh, those guys are going to know what you're talking about when you use those terms, so it shouldn't be a problem. If you're writing for a more general audience, then you'd want to try to define everything. Uh, getting the specialized terminology. That's the second key uh, key component. If there is jargon that is used in your field or within the subject matter you're discussing that is not com in common use, it's going to be up to you to define those terms in order to allow the audience to comprehend your ideas. Again, that's if you're working with a general audience. If you're working with a, a professional audience in the field, they'll probably know what you're talking about, okay, with very minimal uh, discussion as to terms or whatnot, okay, but... If it's an unfamiliar audience, then you're going to probably have to catch them up a little bit, okay? And get to conventions. This gets heavily into phrasing and formatting. Uh, specific fields have styles that have to be conformed to in order to be considered a professional and collegial work, okay? Uh, and this gets into primarily uh, page formatting and formatting for things such as citations uh, or... Uh, how you uh, work things into your text, okay? But it also comes concerns phrasing. Your phrasing has to sound professional. Your phrasing has to match what others are using, okay? Uh, your terminology has to match what others are using. Your uh, tone has to match what others are using, honestly, okay? Now, as far as formatting uh, elements, though, style guides come in handy here. Every field has a specific guide that's called for, okay? You may be wondering why we specifically go with MLA format for a lot of uh, collegiate papers, and that's because that's a standard academic format, okay? A lot of academic journals, uh, general academic journals will use this, okay? English uses this. History uses it, okay? Uh, many of the uh, liberal arts fields use MLA format, okay? So uh, you might be familiar, MLA stands for Modern Language Association, Okay, so that's why you see a lot of communications fields uh, and liberal arts fields using MLA. Uh, APA, APA stands for American Psychiatric Association. Okay, uh, the APA has their own fo own formatting. Okay, and there are fields that specifically call for APA outside of psychology and psychiatry. Okay, uh, one thing that you can expect to see APA style called for medicine. Okay, uh, if you're in the medical field, it's a, if you're going into nursing, uh, any any uh, journal and uh, journal articles that you see uh, in medical journals are typically going to be in APA format. Okay, uh, one thing that might surprise you: uh, sociology and education also use APA format. Okay, so those are the primary ones you see. The third one I have listed here is Chicago style. 
Uh, Chicago style is especially specialized uh, in that it's primarily used uh, in by typesetters. Okay, it's used for uh, conventions for cit citations in books. Okay, uh, specifically in published books. Okay, so it can go across different fields, but if it's going to be published in like a regular book, uh, then your citations going to your citation your formatting has to follow Chicago style. Uh, in fact, if you read the Chicago style, uh, uh, the Chicago the original st Chicago style guide was uh, created by a, a pair of professionals named. Uh, you basically know them as Strunk and White. Okay, uh, that's all. But that's what they're always referred to. However, one thing you may not know about Strunk and White is that the white half of that is E. B. White. Okay, you may know E. B. White uh, because you've probably read some of his work, especially if you are a child. E. B. White was a children's author. Specifically, E. B. White was the author of Charlotte's Web. He's also the author of The Trumpet of the Swan. Okay, so. Uh, E.B. White and his partner Strunk came up with this Chicago style of formatting, and it's primarily for typesetters to show this is where your book, this is what which page your book starts on, this is how many pages you have to have between different sections, so on and so forth. Okay, that's primarily what Chicago style is. So you usually don't have to worry about that in academia. Uh, the fourth uh, ac key component here is assumptions about the audience. So typically, an academic writer runs on the assumption that their audience is, are, is made up of experts and professionals in the fields and adjusts their writing style accordingly. Okay, So you're basically going to run on the presumption that I'm going to write, I'm a professional in this field, I'm going to write this for professionals in the field, the only ones that are typically going to read it are going to be professionals in the field, they will know what I'm talking about. The idea of writing for the stupidest person in the room, we talked about this way back at the start of the semester, typically does not apply here, as all members of the audience are assumed to be at an equal level. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this can also make entry into the field as a reader very difficult, Okay, because the writers are going to be running on the assumption everybody has the same level of education, everybody has the same level of knowledge, therefore everybody's going to know what I'm talking about when I say term X, which is a total mystery to anybody outside of the field. Okay, so keep keep that in mind as you're writing in academic circles. You can run on this assumption, okay? But if you start writing for general audiences, then you're going to have to adjust to a general, uh, as I said, a general audience. Not everybody's going to have the same level of knowledge that you do. All right, so as a brief exercise here, uh, we're going to have you guys ch trying to uh, uh, understand a uh, academic passage here. Uh, and it's pretty much going to be blind because you're not going to be, uh, it's not something specifically we've been studying here, and it may not be something that you have studied before, okay? Uh, this excerpt is in uh, the first section of chapter 19. It's labeled. It's probably going to be labeled 19A, exercise 19A, okay? Uh, answer these, there's some questions that Yelsky gives after the passage, okay? So I want you to answer these on the discussion board. I'm only having you answer four out of five, okay? Okay, so uh, we're going to skip question three out of this package, but here are the other questions that I want you to answer about this passage. One, what are the key concepts or ideas discussed? Two, what specialized terms or language are present in the passage? Do you understand these terms? If you don't, how much does your lack of understanding affect your overall understanding of the passage? Next question, what assumptions are these authors making about their audience? Who is that audience supposed to be and does it include you? Okay. And last question, how well do you think you understand the passage? How much familiarity with the field of study it's from do you have? And how does that inform your understanding of the passage? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read you the passage here. Uh, you can follow along if you have it up on the uh, uh, in your unabridged textbook or on the uh, MindTap electronic version. Okay, this is a excerpt from 
an article titled Persuasion and Culture, Advertising Appeals in Individualistic and Collectivistic Societies by Sangpil Han and Sharon Shavit. Uh, and this is from the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. So that gives you an idea of what field this is intended for. All right, uh, just three paragraphs. Let's go ahead and read through it. Individualism, collectivism is perhaps the most basic dimension of cultural variability identified in cross-cultural research. Concepts created, related to this dimension have been employed in several social science domains. And the individualism, collectivism dimension has come to be regarded as central to an understanding of cultural values, of work values, of social systems, as well as in the studies of morality, the structure of constitutions, and cultural patterns. Several recent studies have suggested that individualism and collectivism are contrasting cultural syndromes that are associated with a broad pattern of differences in individual social perceptions and social behavior, including differences in the de definition of self and its perceived relation to in-groups and out-groups, in the endorsement of values relevant to individual versus group goals, and in the pattern and style of social interactions. However, little is known about the implications of these cultural differences for another social process that is fundamental to every culture, persuasion. Persuasive communications transmit and reflect the values of a culture. Persuasive messages are used to obtain the compliance of that it achieves the personal, political, and economic ends valued in the culture. Although social influence has always been a central arena of research in social psychology, little is understood about what differences exist in the types of persuasive appeals used in different cultures. Even less is known about the effectiveness of different appeal types in different cultures. What types of persuasive appeals are prevalent in individualistic versus collectivistic cultures? And how do members of these different cultures differ in the extent to which they are persuaded by these appeals? This paper presents an exploration of these questions. <clears throat> okay, so go ahead and read over the passage yourself. Uh, answer these four questions on a, the uh, as replies to the new thread at Questions of the Professor. It'll give you about uh, 10 minutes to do that, okay? Go ahead and pause me while you're doing it.
challenged yourself and you have been able to answer those four questions. Okay? So let's continue looking at developing an academic writing style. This is what you have to do to try to come up with your own academic writing style. Okay? So, there are three guidelines Shigelsky gives for developing your own academic writing style. Okay? They're very helpful. Okay? One thing to remember is how you write affects what you write. The way you present your ideas goes further than just the ideas themselves in an academic setting. Your audience expects you to know how to summarize relevant information, how to quote properly, how to synthesize ideas from your sources, and write coherent paragraphs about complicated subjects. You are also expected to know how to fit your own work into the larger context. These are all things that your academic audience is going to be looking for in your work. Okay? Uh, you need to be able to uh, present that in your work. Okay? Uh, so this involves knowing the conventions for uh, citation, for quoting, okay? synthesis, okay? summary. Okay? Uh, this is going to be requiring you to be able to write coherent paragraphs. Uh, that are not humongously long uh, and to have a good focus to them, okay? And also how your knowledge of how your work is going to fit in with the bigger picture of the entire field, okay? So one thing to remember, good writing isn't necessarily always good writing, okay? Certain fields of study have expectations of writing style that fits within the discipline. Yigelsky's example is that a good history paper does not necessarily resonate as a good economics paper. This also goes along with fitting into a conversation. Your writing style must stay consistent with expectations in the field so that your ideas will be taken seriously and you'll be understood to belong in that conversation. All right. So, what is good for one field is not necessarily going to be good for every field, is what they're basically getting down to. Okay? If you have something that you've written that works as a really good blog posting, uh, it's not going to work as an academic paper. Okay? Likewise, if you have something that uh, works for one academic field, like say, uh, just off the top of my head, a history paper uh, does not necessarily work as a political science paper unless it's actually talked about something specifically political. Okay. Uh, and even then, both of those fields have their own specific styles of terminology and styles of writing that you need to adhere to, okay? And neither one of them is going to cross over. Maybe the subject matter will, but the actual writing won't, okay? So, make sure that your good writing is fitting for that academic field as opposed to good writing for another field that you're trying to force onto the, the field that you're working with. Okay. Another thing to remember, practice make make perfect, but it also means making mistakes. Okay. I remember, you may remember at the start of the semester, I asked you guys to keep a journal because it'd be good practice. I also told you that the discussion boards are intended to be good practice as well. Okay. That's so you can get all your mistakes out of your system. Okay. One thing to keep in mind is to don't expect perfection from the start. Okay. Do not do that. And don't punish yourself for making mistakes when you haven't written for an academic audience before. Everybody's trying to say, oh, it, you need to do this right the first time. Uh, everybody has to do this uh, perfectly as soon as they get to college or whatever. No, there has to be a learning curve, okay? So this is what we're talking about here. You have to allow yourself to have a learning curve. And your instructors need to allow you to have a learning curve as well. So you need to practice. Practice means getting the kinks out of your writing style and learning from the mistakes that you make so that you avoid making them again. Plain and simple. Uh, that's why we do workshopping. That's why we do a lot of peer editing, okay? So that you can see what you consistently do and avoid doing that in future papers, okay? It's not just to, not just to be critical, okay? Although sometimes it is to be critical. All right, so let's talk about some basics of academic inquiry, okay? These are some basic skills that you need to succeed as an academic writer, all right? Uh, one thing is qualify your statements. So you have to mean what you say, 
which means that you cannot generalize. You must use qualifying statements when writing academically. For instance, drivers drive crazy is too general of a statement for an academic work. So it needs qualification. So maybe try to temper it a little bit with some other word choices, such as many drivers drive crazy, which is marginally more acceptable. Okay. Basically, qualification allows you a little bit of wriggle room in case you're wrong. Okay. In case it allows for some, uh, for you to show that you know, this is my interpretation of things. It may not necessarily match yours, but this is how I see things. Okay. And it allows you to do that in an academic setting that's reasonable. Okay. Uh, I've talked before about how you want to try to avoid using hyperbole. Uh, in works, okay. Uh, don't be uh, like our president, where he says everything is the best, the best, the greatest, the most beautiful, yada yada yada. No, 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 it doesn't work, okay. The same thing goes for making generalized statements about how everything is one way, okay. Uh, those kind of generalized statements do need qualification because they're going to be impossible to prove, okay. Uh, to give you the specific examples that Yugelsky has in the textbook, okay, uh, one of the uh, the generalized sentence he gives is drivers just don't pay attention to speed limits, okay. That's a blanket statement that's basically working every driver into a category of they're just a bunch of speed demons, lead foot, can't can't drive 65, yada yada, okay. Uh, there's some qualifications that you can do to make that sentence fit into an academic setting. Uh, there's three examples that he gives. One, drivers often seem to ignore speed limits. Okay, gives you a little wiggle room there. It's not saying everybody does it, it's just saying some do it. Many drivers ignore speed limits. Okay, again, a little bit of wiggle room there. Studies show that most drivers sometimes exceed speed limits. That's actually the most qualified sentence of the bunch because it's using multiple ways of tempering that statement to make it not necessarily about everybody. Okay. Uh, next one, be specific, avoid vagaries. While statements without specifics can sound reasonable in spoken word conversations, they are the absolute death knell for academic works. Okay. Statements like schools can improve if they change do not work in this setting. There has to be a specific proposal in that sentence. Okay. So, you need to have some kind of specific idea of what it is you're trying to say here, okay? Uh, there has to be some kind of specific uh, plan that you're proposing for this or some kind of concrete argument that you're trying to make, okay? Uh, the specific example Yigelsky gives, in order for education to work, things need to change. Great, can you be any more vague, okay? Can you be just a little more vague? I don't think it's vague enough. All right. Uh, Yukowski changed it to something that's a lot more concrete. It's a lot longer, but it also gives you a specific plan of action. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, both administrative and curricular reforms should be implemented. Now we're getting more specific. Now we're trying. Now we're not just saying, "Oh, stuff has to change." Now we're saying, "What specifically has to change?" Maybe we're not necessarily suggesting what the actual change should be, but we are giving an idea that, yes, something has to change. Here is the places where it has to change. Now we just got to figure out what those changes have to be. All right, the next one is give credit. We were just talking last week about plagiarism, so uh, this ties into that. A big thing with academic academia is that you need to give credit. More than, just, more than just citing sources properly, you need to use appropriate language that includes signal phrases to indicate that the information is not something you have generated yourself. It's also to make clear that another human being generated the information. Don't give credit to the article, give credit to the author. Okay? This is another mistake that you commonly see students make. Okay? Instead of giving the author as the source of the information, they're saying it's from an article. Okay, who created that article? Okay, there's a chicken and the egg situation here. All right. So we give Gigelsky's actual examples. Okay. Uh, the example he gives uh, is, like I said, it's uh, creating the article instead of the author. Uh, 
The article states that money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. Okay. Okay, yeah, we had, the article says that, so who generated the article? Where did the article come from? Did it just appear out of the ether? No, no, somebody had to have written that article. So who did? Okay. Uh, a better way of doing that is uh, a couple of other ways, a couple other ways Siegelski does it. The author claims that money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. Okay, it's a little better. You haven't named the author, but you're actually at least acknowledging that the author actually exists, and this just, and this article wasn't just uh, handed down from on high by a deity. Okay. Same with the next version of it. According to this author, money spent on schools can do little to improve educational outcomes. Okay. We're still slightly vague in terms of credit here, but. I imagine if you replace uh, references to the author or this author with the actual author's name, it'd probably be a lot more acceptable. Okay, so give credit where it's needed. Uh, last one here is use use specialized terminology judiciously. Okay, you do not want to basically just stuff your paper with big words to make yourself sound smart because the opposite will be true. Okay, so a lot of people do that. Don't just use excessive jargon wantonly to the point that your essay becomes far too wordy to read comfortably. Okay, we don't want to do that. We don't want to overstuff your essays because then nobody's going to be able to get through them, least of all me. And, you're, and I'm the one that you really want to get through these things so that I can actually give you a grade. Okay, so let's take a look at the examples uh, Yelsky gives in uh, chapter 19. Okay. So, we have a, a, pa a paragraph there. The writer discusses the increasing socioeconomic inequality in higher education. Okay? Uh, so, let's see here. Um, so, this is a uh, excerpt from an article titled The Reproduction of Privilege by Thomas Edsall. Uh, it's for, from the New York Times. Okay? So, here is the paragraph. At the same time that family income has become more predictive of children's academic achievement, so has educational attainment become more predictive of adults' earnings. The combination of these trends creates a feedback mechanism that may decrease intergenerational mobility. As children from higher socioeconomic strata achieve greater academic success, and those who succeed academically are more likely to have higher incomes, higher education contributes to an even more unequal and economically polarized society. Excuse me, I'm just uh, waiting for the sound of everybody yelling bingo on their highfalutin language bingo cards. Okay, because there's an awful lot of really specific and really uh, specialized and, let's be honest here, extremely hoity-toity language in this paragraph. Okay? Uh, so what Yigelsky actually does is try to simplify it. Okay? Some careful revisions to reduce wordiness. Okay? Uh, it's going to actually make it sound a little bit more elegant and a lot more understandable to what they're trying to say. So let's take a look at the, the other paragraph. Okay, It's going to say basically the same thing, but it's going to say it in a simpler way that's easier to understand. At the same time that family income has become more predictive of children's academic achievement, so has educational attainment become more predictive of adults' earnings. The combination of these trends could decrease intergenerational mobility. As the children of the rich do better in school and those who do better in school are more likely to become rich, we risk producing an even more unequal and economically polarized society. Okay? Now, if you can... I'm going to try to reproduce this here on the, uh, the screen, uh, but there are certain words in that paragraph that are highlighted in orange. And these are words that were replacing wordy passages in the original paragraph. So, for instance... Uh, the first one with a change here. The combination of these trends could decrease intergenerational mobility. If you look at the corresponding sentence in the original paragraph, it says, the combination of these trends creates a feedback mechanism that may decrease intergenerational mobility. Okay? So, uh, the word, the one word could is replacing the words creates a feedback mechanism that may. Okay, it's a really simplified language there. Okay, 
Uh, next sentence. As the children of the rich do better in school and those who do better in school are more likely to become rich, we risk producing an even more unequal and economically polarized society. The phrases that were put in to replace wordy phrases are of the rich do better in school and do better in school or more likely to become rich. Okay. The, original, the other paragraph says it this way. As children from higher socioeconomic strata achieve greater academic success, and those who succeed academically are more likely to have higher incomes, higher education contributes to an even more unequal and economically polarizing society. All right, so there's a little bit of judicious editing here as well uh, that we risk part in the uh, second paragraph. Uh, it's trying to... Uh, it's actually trying to qualify some of it, okay? So, uh, double duty here. Of the rich do better in school. That is That phrase is replacing uh, from higher socioeconomic strata achieve greater academic success. Okay? Uh, do better in school or more likely to become rich uh, replaces the phrase succeed academically or more likely to have higher incomes. Okay, says so the same thing, but it's simplified language. It's, I will say honestly, there was a when I uh, marched in band in the band in college, we actually had a joke about this sort of thing, trying to say that college language was so much better than or so much more advanced than what you get in high school. Uh, so we had a cheer uh, that we tried to teach the. Uh, younger band people uh, if we did performances in high schools. Uh, we would teach high school band kids this particular cheer and try to convince them that it was a college football cheer. Okay? Uh, so basically, I will say this. The, the actual cheer uh, the actual cheer was to was basically uh, stop them, stop them, stop them, stop them, take the ball. Okay, that's kind of what it's supposed to be. The cheer is, okay. The actual words that are used, okay. Are you ready for this one? Repel them, repel them, force them to relinquish possession of the oblong ellipsoid. Yeah, we were dorks. Okay, so yeah, you don't want to use too much jargon. You don't want to use a lot of huge words just to just for the sake of using them. Okay, uh, simpler language, even in academic writing, is going to get you further. All right, one other thing I wanted to talk about here, and I, do, I know this is a kind of a short session this week. Uh, in fact, the remaining sessions for the semester are going to be fairly short because there's not a lot more speci special stuff I got to do with you guys. Okay, but one thing I wanted to get through here is active versus passive voice. Okay, now this is a bit of a dispute here because some people prefer one over the other. Uh, some people actually prefer the one that is generally by writers considered to be wrong. Okay, there's no real right or wrong in this. It's just a matter of personal preference. Okay, and sometimes it's a matter of reader preference. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind, to keep an eye on for academic writing, one element that you should uh, watch out for is overuse of passive voice. <clears throat> okay. Many writing instructors will harp on the idea that active voice must be used most of the time and passive voice should be used sparingly. But the thing is, some won't tell you the reason why. Well, here I am to tell you the actual reason why. Okay. To put it very simply, it's a difference in the emphasis that verbs give the subjects they discuss. Okay. It's a matter of where the emphasis lies in the sentence, okay? In an active voice sentence, the subject is taking direct action. So for example, uh, the dog ran to the tree. The cat dug its claws into the bark and sped up the side, avoiding the drooling jaws. The subjects are doing something there, okay? They're actually taking action. Those verbs are describing something that the subject is doing, okay? If you're using passive voice, however, the subject is having action done to it, okay? Usually with verbs in the be, was, family, okay? So if something is doing something, 
that is not the verb is now not an action verb it's actually just a uh, now acting as an adjective for the verb is or to be or was okay so the examples here this says the exact same thing as that previous one okay but it's done in passive voice and as you can tell passive voice tends to be a little bit more dull the dog was running to the tree the cat was climbing the tree the cat was getting away from the dog Honestly, that sounds like a uh, uh, sentence combining uh, exercise from sixth grade, okay? Passive voice has a tendency to slow things down, uh, turns things more pensive, makes your writing sound a little bit more unsure. Whereas active voice is going to be moving forward, it's going to be faster paced, and it's going to keep your audience's interest a bit better, okay? Active voice makes for a more interesting form of writing. It makes your reader more interested in continuing to read. Readers are more willing to read about subjects that are performing actions rather than subjects having actions performed to them. Okay? Uh, so here's the examples that uh, Yagelsky gives between uh, active and passive voice. Okay? Uh, so we're working with a sentence from one of the earlier... Uh, points here. This was when we talk about vagaries, okay? Uh, being more specific. So this was the fixed sentence. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, both administrative and curricular reforms should be implemented. Okay? So, here's what Yelsey has to say about this. The main point of this sentence is that the school, for, school reform is needed. Notice that in the main clause, both administrative and curricular reforms should be implemented. The use of the passive voice places the emphasis on reforms, which is the subject of the clause. Okay, the the passive voice phrase is should be implemented. Okay, it's another form of be. Okay, revising the sentence to place the main clause in the active voice changes that emphasis. Here's how that sentence might look in the active voice. Okay, so listen to the difference here. If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education. They should implement both administrative and curricular reforms. So now the emphasis is not on the reforms, now the emphasis is on the schools. Okay? Just like you saw in the earlier ones, okay? The uh, uh, emphasis uh, in the active voice in my examples, okay? The dog ran to the tree, so the one taking the action is the dog, okay? The cat dug its claws into the bark, okay? The cat. The cat sped up the side, avoiding the drooling jaws. Okay? Once again, it's cat doing all the action in both parts of that sentence. Okay? However, in the passive voice version, now that, that leads to the subject shift. The dog was running to the tree. So now the emphasis is on the tree, not the dog. The cat was climbing the tree. Again, the emphasis is on the tree, not the dog. The cat was getting away from the dog. Now, now here's an interesting one where the, the emphasis is now on the dog. Rather than the subject of the sentence, which is the cat. Okay? <clears throat> so, passive voice has a tendency to kind of miss the point of sentences, as you can see there. Okay? Uh, so, uh, getting back to Yelsey's example. Uh, so, we have if schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, they should implement both administrative and curricular reforms. Is this version clearer, more succinct, or more valid than the original sentence? Not necessarily. Notice that in the revised version, the subject of the main clause is now they, presumably referring back to schools, which shifts the emphasis of the statement slightly. In this case, the passive voice enables the writer to keep the emphasis on the need for school reform, which is the main point of the sentence, not on who will accomplish the reform, which is an important and related topic, but not the focus here. here excuse me. So the use of passive voice in this example does not weaken the writing. Rather, it allows the writer to maintain the appropriate focus. If the writer's focus happened to be on a specific entity responsible for educational reform, the active voice might be more appropriate. For example, let's assume that the writer was discussing reforms that only elected politicians could enact. In this case, the subject would be clearer and the active voice more appropriate. So that turns into... If schools are to solve the problems that prevent students from obtaining a sound education, elected officials should undertake several reforms. So now we have a specific subject in there for the active voice verb to affect. 
Okay. The passive voice should be used judiciously. Excessive or inappropriate use of the passive voice can weaken your writing. Often, active voice results in a more concise prose. But as this example illustrates, writers can use the passive voice as an important tool for emphasis and clarity. Okay? That's really the only good reason to use passive voice. Do not use it all the time. Use it if you need to shift the emphasis somewhere, somewhere and you need to show where that emphasis needs to be. All right, and like I said, this is a short session this week. Uh, that's all I got for you guys. Uh, so here's the agenda for the next couple of weeks, okay? Uh, first off, uh, of course, you should be working by now on the analysis synthesis essays. Uh, that essay is going to be due on December 4th, all right? Next week is the workshop session for uh, these essays. Okay, next week is the workshop se session for uh, the analysis synthesis. Okay, it's going to be the revision workshop. Next week is also Thanksgiving week. Okay, so there will be a video lecture posted next Monday. However, I will not be doing a collaborate session next week. Okay, you guys are going to be allowed to enjoy your holiday. All right. Uh, especially doing it because the 1302s, the session would have wound up on Thanksgiving Day, and I'm not going to pull people away from their families to jabber at me for an hour. Okay? So, uh, so next week, there will be a lecture. There will be no collaborate session. The following week is the proofreading and editing workshop for the analysis synthesis essays. Okay? Uh, there will be a lecture. Okay? Probably be a very short one, kind of like to like kind of like this week's. There will also be a collaborate session, and the collaborate session will try to cover what the material from the previous two lectures. Okay, so, uh, and then obviously that Friday, the la that Friday is the last day of the semester uh, before finals week, and uh, by that time you should have the. Uh, uh, now, since this is due, you should have all of your posts to the discussion board in. You should have MindTap finished because the discussion board and MindTap will both lock on December 4th. Okay? All right, so uh, in the meantime, what you should be working on right now, obviously, now the synthesis essay, getting ready to do that first workshop next week. Uh, should be working with the uh, weekly discussion posts. Uh, should be still working with MindTap. Okay. Uh, if I will also offer this, if anyone wants to try to resubmit any of the previous essays for an improved grade, I will allow that. Okay, as long as you can get it into me before December fourth. Okay, I will not be taking any more essays, uh, any more past essays beyond December fourth. Okay. Uh, and obviously, you should also be uh, working on your practice for the final exam. Okay, uh, that will be coming up in three weeks' time. Okay, so uh, with all that said and done, uh, thanks for com thanks for coming by and watching this. We'll have our uh, regular collaborate session this week. I uh, will see you guys then. Thanks for watching.